just one quick reminder to you all um, while others are getting logged on. Tomorrow um, through the College of Health and Human Sciences, um, Nolan Cabrera is coming to uh, speak. He um, is speaking on, I think the title is um, White Immunity. Hold on, let me just double check and make sure I get it right. Working Through the Pedagogical Pitfalls of Privilege. Um, it's tomorrow morning from 10 to 11.30. And I was just um, forwarding, Brie, I was just forwarding you the email. So if you wouldn't mind posting that as a, um, an announcement, um, what he's gonna do in the talk is really kind of walk through the historical development of whiteness. Um, he's gonna talk through sort of this notion of white advantage, um, how systemic racism is really um, uh, undergirding how whiteness came to be. Um, and again, sort of taking a historical look. So um, a historical look as well as sort of tying it into contemporary times. So um, if you all are interested or have the capacity to attend, I think it could be a really um, helpful event. And again, it's tomorrow 10 to 11.30 and we'll make sure that we post that announcement. So you have those details. Um, I think that was the main announcement that I had for you all. And then just kind of as an FYI, um, on Thursday, we're really going to sort of do a debrief of um, here's what we've done up till now in the course, um, kind of reviewing what, what our guests have um, brought to us the information that we've learned thus far um, and kind of talk through how do we want to kind of move forward with our project. So um, the one thing I'd love for you to think about between now and Thursday is how do we want to collaborate like in terms of logistics? Do we want to use Google? Do we want to do a Microsoft Teams channel? So bring your ideas if you would on Thursday around some of the best ways that you have found to be collaborating in a group like this. Um, Cause we'll talk about that on Thursday a little bit more. Okay, I think that's all I had in terms of announcements and things. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over Dr. Stewart to you. Um, if you wouldn't mind a, doing a quick sort of introduction um, of yourself as you delve into the presentation. Um, and then if we can all, you know, feel free to jot down questions and things that you have so that we can um, have some dialogue at the end of his presentation. Any questions before we get started? No? Okay. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Stewart, and um, you should have permission to share screen and whatnot. Okay. Well, hello everyone. It's uh, it's great to be with all of you. Um, it's it's it is such a uh, man to be studying public health right now is just so huge. I don't I can't think of a time where public health has been more in sort of I don't know front and center than ever before. So this is this is an exciting time, but also like it's such a tenuous time to be studying and learning public health because you're just witnessing you know so much learning and so many errors and just you know it, it's a crazy time but it's i'm happy to be here with all of you and and hopefully this is useful um information that i'm going to share and we can have some discussions if if you all have some questions or um things to contribute there's a lot i um, surely have to learn from all of you and your experiences as well. So um, as far as introductions, I'm a, I'm a public health and preventive medicine physician. So I went to medical school, I'm board certified. Um, so I've, I've done lots of clinical work, but I also have a master's in public health and did um, specialty training in preventive medicine and public health. Um, so um, that's kind of my background professionally. I, I, I did some medical anthropology work in Namibia and, and lived for a couple of years in, in Southern Africa. Um, I was active duty in the army doing flight medicine. Um, I moved here from New York City living um, in East Harlem working at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, out there I, I worked 
um, or volunteered with physicians for human rights doing um, medical asylum forensic exams and um, now oddly enough i'm in fort collins colorado and i work for a local government organization called the health district of northern larimer county um, which is a really cool um, small government organization where we're different than the county health department which is the public health authority for our area we are a special tax district um, which which started out um, really uh, many years ago our county didn't have a hospital and so um, the citizens voted to um, increase their taxes so that they could fund a public hospital and that's how Poudre Valley Hospital started and that, that was how the health district started. And um, then the hospital sort of evolved into a health system, which eventually was, was bought out by UC Health, but the, the special tax district remained. And so now we're um, a, an organization with a similar goal to sort of fill the gaps in our community, the health gaps. Um, so we have, that's kind of our mission. Um, so we have a pretty robust evaluation team, which is built around identifying those gaps um, and, and interacting with the community through our community impact team. I think you all met MJ, um, but we have a community impact team um, that also is working with partners to help um, the partners identify the gaps to see how we can partner with them, which I think is, is much more relevant to this class. Um, some of our biggest programs right now is our, our low income uh, dental clinic. So we serve people who are uninsured, Medicaid, unhoused, and provide dental care for them because there was just nothing in the community um, 10 years ago when, when we built that clinic. Uh, we also, uh, around the same time, 15 years ago, uh, there were not enough and there still are not enough mental health services in our community so we have a pretty robust mental health um, team that works out of primary care clinics we have our own clinic for child and adolescent behavioral health um, an adult clinic and then a lot of advocacy work around behavioral health through our community impact team so those are a few of the programs that we work on and then um, when COVID hit uh, you know with the same mission in mind what are the gaps in the community? How can we step up and serve as a health district, our community? Uh, we very quickly learned about um, some very dangerous issues surrounding homelessness and health and COVID. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna pull up my presentation here and I'll share these slides with you um, at the end as well. So are you all seeing it in presentation mode? Okay. So um, I struggled with, with how to title this, but I think, um, you know, before, before the COVID crisis, there was a homelessness crisis. And here in particular in Fort Collins, we have a housing and affordable housing crisis. So this is kind of, um, you know, March of last year was, was the, the coalescing of, of crises um, and I'm gonna talk more about that. So um, maybe you had a chance to read this, but I, I shared a link to justshelter.org, which provides um, some case studies of people's true stories of, of, of their, their housing and eviction issues. So I wanted to talk about Jonathan because this is a story that we've heard a lot about, um, not Jonathan in particular, but his story is very similar to a lot of stories that we've heard over the last year, working with people experiencing homelessness. But um, Jonathan says, I was renting a room from a man I met on Craigslist uh, that he showed in search of a roommate. I was paying $700 a month to have one bedroom. I paid my rent on time every month in full. In March, he told me his brother was moving in and that I had 48 hours to leave. I refused to leave. And after 48 hours, he tried to change the lock. So I called the police. They told him he couldn't do that and referred him to magistrate. He had owed me over $3,000 by this point for bills I had in my name and property he stole from me. So I filed a countersuit on him. Uh, the COVID stay at home happened and our court date was postponed. 
and as was the eviction until I went out on the same day our court date was supposed to be. And as I was returning home, my girlfriend at the time told me our landlord handed a phone to her and the person stated he was a police officer and we were evicted and had two hours to get out. I did not ever get a chance to get any of my property out. And when I went back three days later, um, my landlord said he threw all my things away, everything I owned, clothes, medications, paperwork, TV, laptop. All I own is the clothes I've been wearing. This happened on March 20th. And since then I have been homeless. Most nights I've slept on the ground and shivered. I am able to afford a cheap hotel room here and there, but I eat what I can, what I can find and sleep when I can. I have nothing now and the landlord didn't pay a single bill. I have pictures of them all showing he didn't pay. He just lived off of our money and threw us and everything we owned out with the garbage. I filed complaint with the attorney general and got nothing. Everywhere I go, I mostly get, I don't know what to tell you, sorry. So I thought that was a poignant example of, of how easy it is to become homeless in this country. Um, Jonathan's story is, is not unlike um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions um, over this, this last year. So um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna give a little bit of background around homelessness and just, you know, um, public health as it pertains to socioeconomic factors in general. But I, I've always liked this quote from Albert Einstein. And I think as I've been in public health, it's very important to really understand an issue um, before, before you can think that you have a solution to it. Um, uh, so if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. So when you truly understand an issue, I think the solutions uh, become much more evident and um, easier, easier to identify. Um, and, you know, I think a problem is also better understood when it's personal to us. And, uh, you know, in this country, homeless or homelessness has a lot of stigma attached to it. Um, we think of it as other. Um, but, but really, I want to start today by reminding everyone that the majority of Americans, and probably most of us, are closer economically to becoming homeless than we ever are to becoming millionaires. Um, and this idea runs counter to the culture of the American dream, but it's much more accurate. And I think it helps us build solidarity with people experiencing homelessness because we realize that uh, for a lot of us, um, we're not too far away from where they're at. Um, maybe you read the Oxfam, um, uh, the inequality study that, that I had um, sent out to you. But the summary from that was it, it took uh, just nine months for the fortunes of the top 1,000 billionaires to return to their pre-pandemic highs. While for the world's poorest, uh, recovery could take more than a decade. Um, so COVID has been... Um, a horribly destructive thing as far as worsening the inequities that already existed pre-pandemic. And in fact, you know, as this article in The Atlantic points out, um, too many of Americans are about one ER trip away from bankruptcy. Uh, you know, I have what's considered pretty good health insurance, but my copay, if I, if I just step foot in the emergency room, it costs me $500. That's for me, for one trip, for my kid, uh, uh, for my partner, any $500 just, just to start, start an assessment there. Um, and most Americans, the majority or nearly half of Americans don't have that kind of money um, just for the copay, let alone covering the extra expenses outside of that. Additionally, a large portion of American workers are so poorly paid um, that the majority, that many of us are, are on a trajectory towards increasing housing instability rather than our lives getting more stable and our housing getting more stable. So the trajectory is, is not a good one. And looking at the economic trends over the last decade, last several decades um, further validates this disparity um, that's been growing for decades. This is not a Trump phenomenon or something recent 
but the disparities uh, been growing between those who have and those who have not for, you know, uh, for a long time, sort of starting really to get bad in the 80s with the Reagan administration. So um, when, when we talk about homelessness, we're talking about systemic inequities, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, we're talking about poverty and many other um, many other things that we won't have time to get into. Um, but I, I guess the point that I wanted to make is, is that nearly all of us are much closer to eviction than we are to ever owning a second home. So trying to build some solidarity, I guess. Um, this is a quote that I've held on to for a long time, and I think it, it really highlights um, an important factor in health. This is from a 1995 a World Health Report put out by the World Health Organization. Poverty is the world's most ruthless killer and the greatest cause of suffering on earth. Poverty is the main reason why babies are not vaccinated, clean water and sanitation are not provided, and curative drugs and other treatments are unavailable, and why mothers die in childbirth. Poverty is the main cause of reduced life expectancy, of handicap and disability and of starvation. Poverty is a main contributor to mental illness stress, suicide, family disintegration, and substance abuse. Um, you've probably seen this uh, in your health, public health um, classes. If you haven't, this is the health impact pyramid. Um, it's, it's a framework for how to intervene um, and to maximize health in our community with our interventions. So the framework emphasizes that we need action at each of these levels, but the interventions targeting at the, the bottom of the pyramid, those of the social determinants of health are likely to have the biggest population impacts. So if we get a community out of poverty, we have massive impacts on their health. Um, that's not an easy thing to do, but um, it is the best thing we could do to improve a community's health. So my profession of, of preventive medicine works at these intersections of policy, uh, population health, social issues, and, and some clinical and, and preventive medicine. So Frederick Douglass understood this when he said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So, um, you know, this is one of the things that I'm passionate about as far as building a strong community starts um, pre preconception, actually, um, and really investing in the mothers and the, the children of our community, uh, because that is really our best hope of creating the healthiest, um, the healthiest community that we can. Um, this is an, another way to think about the uh, different components or determinants of our health. Um, so. Um, 20% of our health is estimated to come from the healthcare and our access to healthcare, or how good that healthcare is. Uh, a larger percentage of that has to do with the behaviors of, of, of individuals as they interact with the community around them. Um, is there safe space uh, for uh, active transport and walking around? You know, what kind of food is available in your community that allows you to um, make those healthier choices, how affordable are it, is it? So a huge contributor to our health, the environment in which we live, the air that we breathe, um, the uh, toxins that are in our soil and in our water, all of those um, play a role um, in contributing to our overall health. But uh, the largest component to that actually are this, these socioeconomic factors. Um, so uh, really uh, the best summary of that is really in, in most cases, the zip code in which you grow up in is gonna determine your health more than any of these other factors. Um, and, and there's been some really sophisticated research that I think has tried to change the, the over medicalization of health um, and quantify causes of death, uh, both morbidity and mortality in a new paradigm. And this is a really cool study um, by one of the leading thinkers right now in public health, Sandro Galea. 
uh, which estimates the deaths attributable to these social factors. Um, so how many deaths are caused by racism? How many deaths are caused by poverty? Um, and so this kind of thinking helps us change the paradigm to thinking, well, we're not talking about high blood pressure. We're talking about poor access to food. We're talking about toxic stress, you know, caused by racism and poverty in our communities. So that really allows us in public health to create interventions designed around these social factors, which contribute more to somebody's health than whether or not, you know, they're taking an antihypertensive um, drug. So, um, you know, talking about people experiencing homelessness, they really experience this uh, one-two punch of being overwhelmingly lacking in basic healthcare access while generally having very complex health needs. Um, for example, you can think about an insulin dependent um, unhoused individual who has diabetes. Um, well, insulin needs to be stored in a refrigerator. Um, so where do you store your, your insulin if you're unhoused and, and have no? Um, diabetes is affected by our diet and um, you should cook healthier food, you know, is, is what, the, what the solution is to, to diabetes for a lot of people. But if you don't have a kitchen, you don't have cooking supplies, how do you cook healthy food to treat your diabetes? Um, Another complicating factor with diabetes are foot ulcers. So if you have no showers, if you're walking everywhere around town, um, how do you really take care of your feet and help prevent those diabetic ulcers? Um, and so, you know, that's one example of if, you're, if you have diabetes, chronic health condition, and are unhoused, how being um, unhoused further complicates your health conditions. Uh, but, you know, less severe, we can take a less severe example of, say, you know, like Jonathan, you're, you're, you've had bad luck um, and you and your dog are out on the streets and you're trying to interview for, for a job. Well, what do you do with your dog if you're trying to interview for a dog, for a job? You know, um, a lot of these really complicating issues of, of being unhoused are things that the average person doesn't have to ask. Um, in their life. And so the, the society and sy systems that are built um, aren't built around uh, these complicating issues. So it, it really is, is a difficult, um, once you're in this cycle of homelessness, it's really hard to get out of. Uh, talking about mortality. So um, a homeless people who are chronically homeless live much shorter lives. Uh, for those experiencing chron chronic homelessness and, and are less than 65 years old, if we compare them to people who are housed, their all-cause mortality rate is about five to 10 times that of the general, uh, general population. Um, so uh, the other additional thing because of chronic poor access to health, people experiencing homelessness also um, will go a long time undiagnosed. Their health conditions, um, cancer goes undiagnosed for years, which is not a good way to treat cancer. You wanna catch it early. Um, and these are a lot of the issues that, that we've identified as we've um, been working in these emergency shelters uh, for people experiencing homelessness um, trying to protect people from, from contracting COVID. Life expectancy generally, uh, if you're chronically unhoused, is, is in the 60s, um, which is not great. Uh, here in Larimer County, our, our life expectancy is around 80 um, for, for the average person. The other thing um, is uh, people experiencing homelessness uh, find themselves in environments uh, that are much more conducive to disease spread. Uh, so these are some uh, health alert network broadcasts that were sent out this summer about some really rare uh, bacterial infections that are not so rare if you are unhoused um, and are in the Denver area. 
So this was a, a rare bacterial infection transmitted by body lice. Um, and then just a week later, another alert network was sent out um, looking at an increase, a spike in shigellosis, um, which we're experiencing you know, in the shelters in the Denver area. Um, and these are things that most of you, most of us will never experience a single case in our entire lives. Um, but uh, just these environments in which uh, when, you're, when you don't have a safe place to shelter, you find yourself are, are uh, greatly lacking in sanitation. You know, and this is a good example of that. Um, here's two people injecting drugs in uh, an environment. Uh, this is so far from a sterile environment where you want to use, if you want to have needles and inject them, you, you want to have a pretty close to a sterile environment. So um, just a pretty good example of, of the types of conditions. Um, and the other you know, major thing to point out is, is conditions of homelessness are largely systemic. Okay, we're talking about trauma, we're talking about high cost of living, we're talking about stigma, mental illness uh, that is untreated, undiagnosed, chronic health problems, and how expensive they are. All of these things contribute to homelessness and none of them are individual choices. So we're, we're constantly having this debate, you know, between the left and right in this country about, you know, the choice of, of of being poor um, and being unhoused, but uh, there's there's no control that any one individual has over U.S. housing policies. You know where they, um, by and large, support um, home owners rather than home renters, as as we saw in the case study at the very beginning with Jonathan. Um, and in fact, you know here in Larimer County. We have an affordable housing crisis, um, and I've worked with uh, both the city and the county health on their um, on a housing initiative to try to figure out how can we solve this um, housing affordability housing affordability crisis. But here you can see Zillow. This is for the zip code 80524 that the health district's included in. Typical home value is four hundred and sixty thousand um, dollars. So I used the same. I use Zillow to sort of determine what your income and your down payment would need to be to be able to afford the average or typical home within the health district zip code. So you can see the annual incomes. These are not low paying jobs um, and these are likely not gonna be any single income. You know, There's no job really in public health that's gonna pay you this much. Um, probably not a lot of professors are making this either. Uh, so to be able to afford the average home means you either got to come with a pretty big um, down payment, which means you're likely not going to have any student debt. You probably came from, you know, a family that had a lot more resources than the average person, or you're going to have to take a long time to start saving up for these down payments. Um, but it's really hard to save up when rent prices keep going up and um, you're, you're putting all of your money towards rent that you essentially are just losing because of um, the housing policies that benefit homeowners. For example, you know, um, I can, the, the interest that I pay on my mortgage, I can write off as uh, tax deductible interest. But for renters, they don't have um, those sort of tax incentives built in place to help them sort of get ahead financially. Um, and then here's, a, here's an example of some stigma in our community. This is a, a public Facebook post from the Larimer County Sheriff where um, he was referring to the Ozit Lawn Center, which was set up this um, past winter and spring as an emergency shelter for people experiencing homelessness. And he says, let's hope city council quits dumping taxpayer money into free food and shelter inside the Ozitlan Center. It's time to return that facility to the community. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, first of all, the food and the shelter actually was were paid by private donations. 
So it wasn't taxpayer money. Um, and the insinuation that um, people experiencing homelessness are not part of our community is, uh, you know, is, is wrong, inappropriate, and uh, further uh, promotes the stigma that exists around this population. And this is an elected official who has a lot of, um, who has a, uh, a, a large following, um, a big public um, voice that has a lot of impact. So these are particularly harmful words. Um, so let me, let me talk um, specifically more about um, COVID-19 and what the local response has been for people experiencing homelessness. So you, you may remember when COVID first started in March, the, the state put out these three different levels. Um, level one was stay at home, two was safer at home, and level three, which I don't think we've ever gotten to in Larimer County is protect our neighbors. But fundamental to each one of these levels is this idea of sheltering or staying at home, because if there's a infectious respiratory virus spreading in our community, um, being at home, uh, isolated from other people is one way to guarantee that you're not going to get it. Um, but if you don't have a home, uh, you become particularly vulnerable to COVID. So COVID very quickly became the case study in housing is health. Um, so not only for homeless folks, uh, but also other um, communities are disproportionately affected. Um, we know that poor, um, unhoused, uh, BIPOC communities are disproportionately um, targeted by COVID and killed um, uh, by COVID. So, you know, these are systemic issues that are created that says, well, why is it that, that Black, Latinx, um, Indigenous populations are getting COVID way more than white and Asian communities? And then after they get it, why is it that they're more likely to die? So, you know, I think we understand a lot of the health inequities that have existed for generations that, that make these communities more likely to die, but why is it that they're more likely to get COVID? Um, and so, you know, going back to this last slide, you can see this is built around people who have homes. Um, so it makes sense that um, the communities that are less represented uh, you know, historically marginalized are going to be more likely affected by the pandemic um, because policies um, like uh, lockdowns benefit um, wider, wealthier populations um, and the, the other communities have, have actually, um, in some communities, there's been good evidence showing that lockdowns have made COVID more harmful uh, for them and protected the, the wealthier class of individuals. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that as, as a um, general theme around this homelessness work uh, that, that we've been involved in. Um, so this was a study that came out um, early on in March of last year, basically showing uh, if you're chronically unhoused, the risks from COVID for hospitalization requiring critical care and of dying from COVID um, are about 15 to 20 years um, younger for a chronically homeless population. So for the average 65 year old, um, the risks of COVID are about the same for the average 50 year old um, who's been chronically homeless. Uh, again, this came out in March of last year and was, was maybe the understatement of, of the month at that time, but basically saying hey, COVID is probably going to be a problem for our homeless populations. And um, it was in this context that 
the uh, Northside Ozatlan Community Center was, was um, converted over to an emergency homeless shelter from March to June of last year. So every year um, in Fort Collins, uh, Catholic Charities, Rescue Mission, and the Murphy Center all work together to serve um, the unhoused population in our community uh, during inclement weather. So um, every night there is um, shelter for people within the rescue mission or Catholic Charities. And then the city helps contribute some money to open up um, an overflow. In the past, it's been the Community of Christ Church that's been used as an overflow shelter. But what we learned in March is that um, typically uh, people are packed into these shelters, you know, like sardines, and that is um, not conducive for preventing the spread of COVID. And so um, after identifying that the current shelter setup was not a safe environment, um, a partnership was set up uh, between the city and the shelter organizations um, to open up the Ozatlan Center as an emergency shelter. And um, what we were trying to avoid is, is what you know, we were seeing in the news at the time, all these shelters um, that very quickly became COVID outbreak sites where it went from, you know, two, three people with COVID to all of a sudden the entire, shel the entire shelter community uh, was infected with COVID. So that is what we were trying to avoid. Um, and the organizations that came together, you can see here, um, the collaborative was between Homeward Alliance, the Rescue Mission, Catholic Charities, the Health District of Northern Larimer County, the City of Fort Collins was providing the facilities, although um, the payment for the facilities was being covered uh, by uh, an anonymous donor. And then we had um, uh, Holly from Homeward 2020 was another organization and that was collaborating and she was helping be the site lead and sort of bringing all of these organizations together. Uh, and Holly approached the health district early on and said, we don't have anything as far as um, health protocols set up. And so that's where um, uh, the health district came in. So MJ, uh, Brian, Taylor, and myself were part of the the, the medical or health team that came in to create, we had to come up with a plan for, okay, so if we have 200 people in the shelter and all of a sudden we identify people who are sick with COVID symptoms, what are we gonna do with them? Um, we can't kick them out of the shelter to the streets um, in the winter, that doesn't work. So we had to create um, a recovery, a recovery site. And so, um, this is, this is a schematic that we came up of the Azatlan Center. This, was, this is the big gym, um, huge space, really high ceilings, good ventilation, ideal space. Um, if you're gonna have a congregate emergency shelter, this was kind of the ideal place for it. So it was, it was a wonderful space. Uh, we saw about 150 to 200 people that came through there every day. But then we, you know, going through the shelter, we saw there were these big conference rooms. And so, we got permission from the city to set up these rooms as recovery rooms. Uh, and then what we created were infection prevention protocols. So we tried to set up um, temperature screenings, hand washing stations, and symptom checks for all of the, the guests that entered the emergency shelter. Um, and this, you know, it seemed fairly straightforward on paper, but what we quickly learned is this was much more complicated um, and harder to get compliance uh, early on. So what we did is we started to build um, a hand washing station and temperature checks around the meals. So we encouraged all of the partner organizations to uh, serve, serve the three meals that they normally serve in this one facility. And what we did is we built um, hand washing hygiene. And then um, before this hand washing station, we had health district staff there with um, no touch thermometers checking everybody's temperatures. We wanted to do it as they entered the building, but what we found is uh, people 
um, had been outside in the cold. And so because they were cold, they were coming in with temperatures that showed they were hypothermic. Um, and so we, we, they were inaccurate, um, uh, no touch temperatures. So we had to bring them in and they had to basically warm up for 30 to 45 minutes before we could ever check their temperatures. So that was one of the first obstacles that we had to overcome with creating these infection prevention protocols. But you can see, we tried to maintain some distance, um, social distancing in the line. The check-in staff from Homeward Alliance and Catholic Charities had these, um, you know, what, what we see all over the place now, these plexiglass um, barriers that you, you can't hear anybody through. So people just end up turning their heads to the side and speaking around them. So I don't know how effective they really are, but um, this was really early on. This was, you know, March, April of last year before this was the norm. Um, and then uh, overnight, you know, we set up these beds that were um, measured out to be about 12 feet apart from, from um, each other. Um, trying to create as much distance as we could in that space. And then this is this is one of the recovery rooms that we set up, um, you know, and like the moment we showed up, uh, we had seven or eight people that were that had fevers and coughs. And so we actually filled up these rooms pretty quickly. Um, this was our first guest in. Uh, you can see the zebra blanket here. Um, we had a HEPA filter that we set up, you know, we had Netflix there. We had, um, you know, a, a sharps container for anybody who had um, needles and uh, just really tried to create a space where people were um, taken care of and could stay in this space uh, for the recommended isolation period. Um, these are the numbers of people that access services. Uh, we um, started to track those numbers uh, towards the end of March. Um, and you can see um, how many we served, you know, for lunch uh, was kind of our biggest meal of the day. And then if this was kind of the cumulative number, if we took those um, unduplicated who accessed any services there throughout the day, we're seeing about consistently 200. What happened um, in April uh, as, you know, I think as um, we got pretty crowded in the shelter is people started to camp out in the, the field just outside the Ozatlan Center along the Poudre River Trail there. Um, and that created quite a stir with the sheriff and the city police and even um, a lot of uh, city council members were involved um, because it became a very visible thing to the community, this encampment uh, created a lot of stir. And so what happened is, um, despite uh, our advocacy for maintaining this encampment, uh, it was closed down by the city police sort of unilaterally against the wishes of all these shelter organizations. And what it did, um, and what CDC actually said it would do, which it caused uh, people to, um, less people to access services, and it caused people to disperse into the community, uh, which uh, was not a great option uh, when we're trying to prevent the spread of COVID and try to maintain regular surveillance for this um, high-risk community. Um, so from this time, you know, just uh, in this, in the Ozatlan Center, we did about 25,000 temperature checks, about that many hand washings. Um, and then after um, the state sort of managed to set up a much better testing protocol um, and procedures, we were able to work with the state on getting uh, mass testing events. So the health district in partnership with Homeward Alliance um, was able to um, do over 500 uh, mass tests of, for COVID. And actually um, from our mass testing, we only found one positive test. Um, so 
from that time in the Ozatlan Center, uh, you know, we don't know the early people on that we had in our isolation and recovery side. We weren't able to get them access to, to timely testing for COVID. So we don't know if they actually had it or not. Um, they certainly had classic COVID symptoms, but we, we did a pretty good job. And I don't know if it was anything we did, but we never had a major outbreak of COVID during that time. So um, maybe a great success story. Maybe, maybe it was nothing we did that made any difference whatsoever. We're certainly open to that. But one thing that did make a difference is we were able to just be in there to talk to people who otherwise hadn't had good case management. And we were able to do a bunch of brief interventions and um, help with case management for a lot of different people. Um, I saw a question come in. What was the public decision or reason for closing the camp? And what was the real reason? <laughs> um, I think I have a slide that, that kind of goes into that here in a second. So let me know if I don't answer that. So in our recovery side in the Ozilon Center, uh, we served 47 people. Um, we took on some families, mostly individuals. We had four people who were confirmed positive for COVID. Uh, we don't know how many were truly um, COVID positive because testing was, was an issue early on. But we had, um, what, what we ended up doing is actually the, the Ozatlan conference rooms weren't adequate. So we acquired a couple houses in Fort Collins that were vacant and set those up as additional sort of overflow isolation and recovery sites. And so we started receiving referrals, not just from the people who were working inside the emergency shelter, but um, Family Housing Network sent us some families um, and the hospital system started to send us people who um, didn't have anywhere to safely isolate or quarantine. Um, and I just want to point out that the Larimer County Sheriff's Department had more COVID confirmed COVID cases than we ever did at the Northside Ozatlan Center. Um, oh yeah, so I, I thought I had a statement here on the encampments. So this was the CDC's guidance at the time. They said, unless there is individual housing units available, which we didn't have, um, they said, do not clear encampments during community spread of COVID. Clearing encampments can cause people to, dis to dis disperse throughout the community and break connections with service providers. So this increases the potential for infectious disease spread, right? Which makes sense. So if, if we had them at, at um, the emergency shelter and they were sleeping out in the lawn, but able to access the meals where we could do three times a day surveillance on symptoms and temperature checks, check in with them. They had access to showers and bathrooms. They weren't hopping on the bus to travel around the city. They weren't going into coffee shops or other businesses, uh, potentially exposing themselves to people who might give them COVID. Uh, it makes sense, right? That, that we would keep these encampments, but, but this kind of image that you can see here in Denver and if you've driven through Denver right now, you can see these encampments out, um, is not good for the public image. Um, and um, law enforcement in particular does not like these things. Um, so that, that was a friction point um, for our partnerships uh, with the, the city police and the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. They actually um, partnered with the sheriffs um, to do um, drone surveillance of the Fort Collins encampment. We, we went outside there and saw they, they had been hovering these drone drones for days, um, identifying people in these encampments. And so when they closed it down, they ended up doing a lot of arrests on that day. Um, I think it was something like 10 to 15 people from the encampments that they ended up um, uh, taking into the county jail. Uh, from the disbanding of that encampment. So, uh, you know, the, the official statement was that it was for, um, it was for the community's health that the encampment was disbanded. Um, and uh, they worked with the city to help expand space within the Ozatlan Center. Um, so we were able to get access to workout rooms upstairs to put people 
um, that um, didn't have a, a safe space to go. So that there was some negotiation that happened. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at chats here. Yeah, so um, the encampment uh, disbanded, but um, there's been some new research actually out of um, some CDC partnership with some Denver organizations. And this was presented at an infectious disease conference. And what they did is they looked at COVID spread amongst the congregate shelters compared to people that were camping out for most of the time. And um, they, they basically found, you can see here that the prevalence of COVID was higher amongst the shelter community. And then what they did is they looked at antibody tests to see who had had previously a COVID infection. And you can see one out of four people in the shelter had had COVID. Um, mostly, most of them probably went undiagnosed at the time. And then versus comparing that to the encampment, which makes sense, right? When you think about um, how COVID spreads, that it was a much lower prevalence. So these encampments proved to be in this study, a much safer environment for people experiencing homelessness as far as contracting COVID goes. So some really cool research um, out of Denver that I think was relevant to us at the time. Um, so, so the Azatlan Center uh, disbanded in June. Uh, the city said it, it needed to open up for the recreation needs of our community, uh, for the child care needs of the community. There's some child care um, that takes place um, and has taken place since July. Um, they, uh, I'm unsure if it's been open for, um, you know, the gym for accessing the gym in the Ozilon Community Center. Um, but I know it has been used for community, um, some camps over the summer and uh, for childcare. But um, we asked the city this fall if we could have the facility back and, and they gave us a pretty firm no. So what happened is um, the emergency shelter for this season, if you haven't heard, has been um, the vacant warehouse at the food bank. And so that was another partnership between Rescue Mission, the city, um, to be an overnight only uh, facility. So what happens is um, every day at seven or 7.30, uh, anyone who was accessing overnight um, shelter at the food bank gets kicked out of the warehouse and actually has to leave the property. And so they um, disperse into the community. Um, and so um, what happened, so that, that was stood up in November. And at the same time, the health district, we continued to run our two houses um, at Myrtle Street and Shields. We have two houses not far from CSU campus. And, uh, you know, since the Ozatlan Center closed up until the new shelter opened up, we'd been open for isolation, recovery, and quarantine. But we hadn't been terribly busy. We were, we were busy in August. You can see we served um, 13 people. But um, in the early fall, we weren't terribly busy. But as soon as the shelters opened up uh, for emergency sheltering, uh, we started to see more people referred to us. And then what happened is they got access to mass testing again in partnership with the state and county health. And uh, we saw a rapid outbreak of COVID take place in that community. So I think um, at the food bank, it went from three cases one week to the next week being six week, six cases. And then the week after that, it was 45 cases. And that's, that's that peak in December. And the really problematic thing, you would think in November, we would have sorted this out, but the first two weeks of mass testing, both of those, um, both of those uh, lab results, they both took over 10 days to get back to us. So for, for 10 days, we were in the dark about how many cases there were. So we saw there were three cases and then we were waiting um, 10 more days until we found out that there were six cases seven days before. Um, and by then, uh, 
by then it had already spread so rapidly amongst that community that um, it probably had reached um, natural immunity, the herd immunity. Um, but in this, at this point in December, in our isolation site, we actually had more people at our isolation site than any one of the hospitals had uh, for COVID positive people. So huge outbreaks. Um, Harvest Farms is another um, pseudo shelter environment. They are for uh, substance use treatment for people experiencing homelessness. They have about 60 people um, at their uh, residential site and they had another major outbreak um, where over 50 people, I believe, were positive. So um, December was a really bad time for people experiencing homelessness and we were extremely busy and uh, didn't have any space for people to isolate. So we finally were able to engage with the county to set up um, uh, a hotel in Loveland, which we currently are operating right now uh, for uh, people experiencing homelessness to isolate, recover, and quarantine uh, for around COVID. So that is kind of our day-to-day -day operations right now. This number here in January doesn't reflect the 10 people that we got over the weekend from community corrections, um, some of whom are uh, positive and others just require a, a space to quarantine. But the hotel has been a great model because we're able to keep people in their individual room. We're able to meet them at the door. So it's safer for our staff. Um, it's safer for them. It's a better space, uh, more comfortable. Uh, so they're less inclined to want to leave the site. Um, so um, that's been kind of a success. And we've run that in partnership with Homeward Alliance and with the county who's been the major funder um, and health district's been funding that in part as well. And then another important partner has been um, Precision Security who's been helping sort of run the overnight um, monitoring for that site. So um, lots of really cool partnerships um, and creative sort of innovations that we've had to create. Uh, another partner actually um, that, that we've had has been the NOCO party bus. Um, they typically run these big sprinter vans um, for parties and, you know, social events, you know, weddings or whatever, but they have um, a barrier between their driver and their passengers. So they're really the only ones in town that can safely transport somebody who either has COVID or who we suspect has COVID. So even today, we're still partnering with NOCO Party Bus on transporting people around who either need to be transported to the hospital or from the hospital to our isolation site um, or um, you know, uh, from, our, from our isolation site to, to other, other areas. So um, we've had to remain very nimble, very creative because um, you know, there's no textbook that we can reference on how to set up um, an isolation and recovery site for people experiencing homelessness during a COVID pandemic. This is all, this is all new and it's required partnerships um, um, in really innovative and flexible and creative ways. So um, with that, um, you know, the other really exciting thing from all of this, um, which I don't mean that, you know, in, in any sort of way to d diminish the tragedy that has been COVID um, and the effects of, of, of COVID on our society as far as the collateral damage. But um, these two pandemics are really an opportunity for us to reassess the situation and say, um, I don't like using this because it's it's been co-opted by the current administration, but really how do we build back better? Um, and how do we sort of break down these systemic problems as we start to think about how we recover from, from the COVID pandemic? So there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of hope amongst the tragedy of all of this. Um, and one thing that, you know, I've kept this with me since, um, November 9th was actually, um, a, uh, this was on, was it November 9th? Yeah, it was, this was election day in 2016, 
But Valerie, Valerie Cower um, wrote these words, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if, what if our America is not dead, but a country still waiting to be born? What if the story of America is one long labor? Um, and that I think is a really um, evocative, uh, you know, uh, prayer um, that that I've thought about often right now. As as this has been a very discouraging time in public health, as as we think about all of these issues that that COVID has sort of brought front and center, and how we can really sort of um, build a better America and a better um, better health for all people and really break break down the inequities that have existed. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but this is this is my email if anybody wants to sort of correspond or um, get involved or has questions about uh, about these things. Or feel free to reach out. Sorry, that was me talking a whole lot but hopefully some of it was interesting. Yeah, no, I, I just wanna say thank you. I think um, this has been a really important hour. I'll speak for myself and I think for others here to um, better understand in a very localized context what this looks like. And so I just really appreciate the time um, that you spent really allowing us to get a fuller picture of um, homelessness here in Fort Collins. Um, and in particular, what the response has looked like during COVID. Um, so I'll pause and just see what questions, if you can stay on for a few more minutes. Yeah, um, absolutely. If we've got some questions. Or comments or grievances. Um, I am pretty curious about um, how funding worked. Like, did you get grants? Was it from your organization's funds that, that you already had? Um, I'm just kind of wondering what that looked like. Yeah, uh, the, the funding has been, um, hasn't been as big of an issue as, as we, we initially thought it might be. So one, the CARES, um, the CARES Act, you know, that was passed early last year when COVID hit, a lot of those dollars, most of them went to the city and the county. Uh, but we were at, at the health district able to get some of those dollars that we were able to use to run our isolation and recovery site. Uh, you know, having overnight security is expensive, um, upgrading these houses to be suitable spaces for people to recover. Um, so some of it came from federal grants. Uh, there was a local community grant that Homeward Alliance and the health district received. Um, there were an anonymous, anonymous donors that stepped up locally. I suspect it was Pat Stryker in Bohemian. That's my guess. Um, uh, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, that's our local billionaire, if you don't know. Um, and let's see, health district has used some of our reserve funding. We've had some money that's set aside in reserves for emergencies and our board approved, um, you know, $500,000 early on for COVID response. So that was, that was good. Um, who else? So rescue mission, a lot of people, you know, just individuals, citizens have stepped up and donated a lot to Homeward Alliance, to the food bank, um, to Catholic Charities, Rescue Mission, all these shelter oper operators. Um, and so they've, they've um, been fairly well funded throughout this pandemic, which is, you know, which is great, but also problematic that a lot of the, what should be government responsibility is, is, is through private donors in this country, which is, uh, you know, a whole different lecture and conversation. I can see Hannah put a question in the chat, um, whether Poudre Valley is a nonprofit and whether any of it falls under community benefit. Yeah, yeah, so um, 
Poudre Valley Hospital, along with Medical Center of the Rockies, are the two big um, hospitals in Larimer County. Uh, both of them are owned and operated by UC Health, which is a you know really large nonprofit organization. Um, my understanding of the co community benefit is that because they're a nonprofit, they they are uh, mandated by state law to participate in the community benefit. But one way in which they can participate is by writing off their bad debt. Um, so if they if they serve people. Um, who don't pay their health bills, then they can write those, those off with their um, community benefit. So, so a lot of that money that is supposed to be benefiting the community, and maybe in a roundabout way you could say that it is, is actually just going back to benefit them and, and um, hedge, their, hedge their bets, or their, their debts, rather. <laughs> I also had one other question. Um, you had shown a graph that was like the antibodies versus something else. And I just noticed there was quite a large gap between men and women um, as to who, and I don't know if that's just because of sample sizes or like some other things that might be going on with this population. Um, let me see if I can go back to that. So it was not the antibody slide you're saying, it was the um, COVID uh, PCR slide? I think it was the antibody one. Oh, it was the antibody, yeah. let me see. Um, so it looks like the gender disparity is 10% um, positive among women and 18% among men. Um, Looks like they did a chi-square test and showed that that was a statistically significant difference. Um, but the sample size for women was seven compared to 44 for men. So that may be part of the issue. Um, most of the encampments tend to be um, more likely um, male. So. But uh, I will say anecdotally, um, Catholic Charities has been the overnight women's shelter um, and they have not had the same outbreaks in the same magnitude as the overnight men's shelter at the food bank. So I don't, I don't know how to explain that. Thank you. Did, um, I, I, I'm curious if, uh, well, actually, I think, you know, the, the understanding the finances of all of this is really not super sexy, but I think that's a really interesting way in which people can get involved. Um, and as, as community members, really um, advocating with these local organizations, even like the health district, the fact that we had half a million dollars to put towards this, you know, did we have more? If there had been a community sort of mobilization to advocate for more money, you know, would that have happened? Um, you know, county health also has a board of health directors and they have public meetings where they take public comment, county commissioners, city council, all of these are opportunities to like really say, hey, step up and put some money up front because this is a once in a lifetime pandemic. Let's, let's throw money at this and we'll recoup the costs later on and be creative later on. But right now we got to respond to, you know, um, we, we experienced fires this summer. Like we had to put everything we could to put those fires out and really just sort of accept the debt of that. Um, and we'll figure that out down the road. But right now, you know, that's, it's a really, I think an opportunity for the average person to get involved and have a high impact in, in the money side of things. The other thing I'll add to that is it's relatively speaking, 
so easy to join those meetings right now because you can join most of them remotely. Um, so even just speaking for myself, the ability for me to give public comment at city council has been, I mean, there's just so fewer barriers and that's something I'm hoping, you know, part of what I advocate for every time I do give public comment is that we continue this opportunity to do them, you know, uh, to, to access them remotely, but it is an opportunity that's very accessible right now. Um, just as you're thinking about the possibility of doing some advocacy in that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious of the class's thoughts on um, advocacy on social media around all of this. That was one of the things with this encampment. There was just this buzz on Facebook around this encampment. And I would say 95% of the comments were negative. Um, we're promoting sort of the stigma around all of this. This is crime. This is trash. This, uh, these are outsiders coming to camp on uh, the precious Poudre River Trail. Um, but I, I, I've often wondered if it's good to engage in that, to sort of bring the masses to, to counterbalance this Facebook um, buzz, or whether it's best just not to engage um, you know, in hopes that you marginalize this, um, these sort of vocal minority. Um, I'm curious what all of you think who engage much more probably in social media. I don't Do personally have... think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Javier. Oh, uh, you can go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I don't personally think that social media is a great place to hash these things out. I think it's it, social media can often be an echo chamber for people and they wanna see what they, you know, what they believe and they don't wanna hear your side. But I, I think having like these conversations with your more immediate circle, even though it's harder to have those conversations with like your grandpa or your uncle or your aunt than it is for someone you went to high school with on Facebook, I think they're, they have more of an impact. Um, I don't know. I personally stay away from doing much of that on social media. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think sometimes social media, those comment strings can get so long and it's very easy for people, I feel like, to just dismiss what someone else says because um, it's essentially like they don't have to argue in a way because there's not anyone trying to counter argue them. They can just say whatever they want. I think there are times that social media can be very powerful though. Um, I was gonna ask if there are any statistics or any information on, um, you had mentioned that there's a lot of comment of individuals saying these aren't our community members. And I was wondering if there's any information on is the homeless population within specific cities, like can they identify that they're actually a part of this communication, they're, or this uh, community, um, meaning like these are members that have lived um, in the community for, um, you know, years, like maybe they have family here, here in Fort Collins. Um, I don't yeah. know if there's information on that because I do wonder if there's a possibility of sharing stories of a community member who is experiencing homelessness um, so that it does kind of, you know, it's not a, oh, they, maybe they traveled on a bus from another state. It's a, no, they, they've been here for, you know, for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great point. I think, um, you have to be careful as you talk about that because I'm new to this community. So am I not welcome here? Um, like if, if I show up in a new community, like is there rules around how people can move in between a community? So it's like this, this false, uh, this false argument of like, well, they're not part of our community. Well, they're here now. So they are. Um, and what defines community, but I think yeah. to, to the more, you know, direct to the point, uh, Homeward Alliance is, um, and Taylor Kelly, I think you met Taylor, um, they track these numbers very closely. Um, and I think, you know, up until November, since the pandemic started, Homeward Alliance had seen 1,200 unduplicated clients. 
and they said, and actually their, their executive director and I presented to the county commissioners on this, but I think it was around 70% of the people that they've served are people that have been in the community long term. So, um, so it is by and large uh, people who have been here longer than I have, you know, and most of the people in this community are, are transplants um, anyway. Um, I, I really, <laughs> I hate to see this Colorado native um, bumper sticker or this pride that people have, like none of us are, well, most of us are not actually native to this area. Um, this is not our land. Um, so, so I don't like to engage too much in that, in that argument, but the, the numbers do support um, just a, an upfront rebuttal to that, that it is mostly people that have been in our community and stay in our community. Okay, well, I'm looking at the time. Um, there is one other question. Morgan had a question in, so Dr. Stewart, if you could stay on, if you don't mind just answering yeah. that one more question. Yeah. Those of you who need to go, please feel free. Um, and I'll see you all on Thursday because I, I know that we're a couple of minutes over, but um, I'd love, yeah, if you don't mind um, answering Morgan's question before we hop off. Um, next steps, yeah. So um, we are looking to engage community partners on figuring out um, how to really solve the homelessness and health gaps that we've identified. So COVID has been a major issue, but what we've seen is that the majority of people we've seen have gone without access to healthcare for years. And so um, we want to be a major player in, um, you know, in, in filling in those gaps, whether it is partnering with a federally qualified health center like Salud to create a standalone clinic designed for people experiencing homelessness, building something totally new in partnership with the, you know, at the Murphy Center, um, or making something more mobile, like a, a mobile clinic that gets out and does more street health type stuff. So we're engaging different partners right now, the Street Dog Coalition, um, the um, UC Medical School are some people that we've been working with, um, the Murphy Center. Uh, you know, we ha I have a meeting this afternoon with Salud's um, medical director to kind of talk about, just brainstorm some ideas um, because they, you know, are the main medical home for most of the people who are chronically unhoused in our community. So they're our safety net clinic. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of next steps for us is thinking about how we can really create a health system around the unique health needs that are there for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, how long, so we're, we, we have to move out of the hotel. Uh, February 12th is our last day. And then we still have our two houses. And I suspect based off of the current trend of COVID that the two houses that we have are adequate to meet the ongoing needs. Um, but really, um, we just got approved as a vaccine provider and ordered vaccine yesterday. So we're hoping to really vaccinate our way out of this problem um, and, and focus primarily on people experiencing homelessness um, so that we can get out of the business of running an isolation and recovery site. Thanks so much for uh, sharing that information. That's really great. And congrats on, you know, being approved to be a vaccine site. That's really, that's really exciting. So yeah, yeah, we're excited about it. It's been stressful trying to create all these new projects and programs, but <laughs> I wow. think uh, it's, it's not unique to us, though. Everybody's kind of scrambling to do things in a different way. Mm. Well, I, like I said, I just want to um, echo students and thank you so much for your time um, and the information you shared. Like I said, it really has given us a much more robust picture. I think, um, you know, for us to be as informed as possible as we think about how we can support this, how we can take on some little, you know, sort of community assessment components. Um, so yes, we just really appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, and then we'll probably invite you back at some point uh, and loop you in at some point if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 
thank you to all of you. I appreciate um, having an opportunity to share these things and the enthusiasm of, of learners to want to engage with these issues is always, it always lifts me up. So um, thank you to all of you as well. Okay, well, um, we'll wrap up for today. Um, and then I'll loop back with you, Dr. Stewart, about your slides. If you don't mind, like you said, sharing those, that would be um, helpful. Um, and then for all of you, uh, everybody else, I'll see you all on Thursday.